so I'm pitching for a cognition first theory of evolution. Okay. The usual orthodox understanding of the relationship between cognition and evolution is that cognition is a product of evolution. That evolution by natural selection comes first, and it sometimes, albeit rarely, produces things which are cognitive. And I'm considering the reverse, that cognition comes first, and that in special cases, sometimes, perhaps rarely, produces, produces natural selection processes. Uh, so the, um, you know, obviously that has some the, you know, the words are slightly different, but it has some resonance with uh, a consciousness first sort of theory of things. But um, I don't want to end up with a model of things which has a sort of a strong physical stroke, non-physical distinction between things. I would rather have a theory where there's a graded scale of things which are more physical and things which are less physical. And that there are, so there are different, multiple different levels of causes, which um, are each of which is slightly real to the levels either side of it, right? How are we doing so far? Hanging in there. I'm, I'm interested to see how this goes. All right. Um, so uh, one way, one sort of um, motivation, um, let's do the motivation first, right? So I'm trying to keep things tied to biology uh, and to answer questions that need answering in biology. Um, and in biological systems, you know, the sort of the orthodox view that uh, genes control everything at the bottom and everything that organisms do above that, the, in, you know, the, the regulatory activity, the cellular activity, the tissues and organs and organisms are all just products of the genes. And none of the processes which are going on at those higher levels of organization matter, except in so much as they are consequences of genes which affect genic selection. Is there, you know, everything at the bottom is the only level that matters. Right. Whereas in reality, we know that there are self-sustaining causal processes going on at all of those levels of organization. You know, the cells are at the level of organization of cells, real things that interact with other cells with certain kinds of signaling that create self-sustaining conditions for cycles that recreate the conditions for their own origination at that level of organization. It's great to be able to say some that something like that and have somebody nod. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that's great. Uh, the thing about you know that's that's true in in physical systems too. But the you know the, you know from you know quarks to the cosmos. But uh, mm -hmm. the thing about biological systems, organisms, is the connections between those levels and the relationships between them. So the levels below smaller scales create the entities that get involved in the relationships at the higher level and the levels above create the context or boundary conditions in which those entities move or in interact with each other. So the level above and the level below is needed to define whatever is going on at the focal level that we're talking about. Uh, but what's the relationship between those levels? Because it isn't we're not satisfied with a story where the bottom level determines everything right? because it doesn't determine the boundary conditions under which those entities move. <clears throat> and we're a bit uncomfortable with starting at the other end uh, that, you know, as though, because it seems to imply that there was a plan into which everything should fit. Uh, a plan that, that created all of the parts that was necessary to make, you know, the high level thing that was intended in some sense. So uh, let me see if I can stop my laptop pinging a second. Hold on. <laughs> so I want to suggest that the 
um, that there's a that 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 the the way in which those levels interact with each other has a specific general form um, that's to do with compression and expansion between levels. And that when levels are linked in that way, the interaction between levels is what agency is. The interaction between levels is what cognition is. And that that kind that kind of multi-level structure arises spontaneously and naturally without presupposing any of this particular biological machinery. Um, that it's a natural property of physical systems and that it's cognitive in nature so that it's capable of holding uh, memories, doing learning and using learned knowledge to act in the world in a way which constitutes intelligent problem solving. Uh, so I drew a little picture today um, riffing off a picture from your work don okay can i uh, uh let's find that document You'll note, I'll share it in a second, but you'll note that these are hot off the press because I drew them with a pen and paper and took a picture of them. I haven't turned them into a <laughs> into a electronic form yet. Let's okay. see if I can uh, share the screen. Okay, can we see that? Yes. Okay, so in figure A, we have a an agent separated from the world uh, and the detail of the world is sensed uh, by the agent into percepts. Mm, some sort of decision process, cognitive process happens, which turns that into a decision. And then the decision uh, um, organizes the actions back into the world. So that's inspired by your way of decomposing things, Don. Does that make sense yeah. so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'm going to turn that into a slightly more computational way of thinking about those relationships. So now out there in the world, we have some system of entities with interactions between one another, which is all sorts of complicated. That detail is compressed into a lower dimensional model of what's going on in the world. You run that model a little bit, things happen. And the results of running that model are then expanded back into the world. So you have an information integration, uh, run the model, and then collective action uh, transferred back to the world. So I think that you know, from a sort of computational cognitive science, mm -hmm. cognitive intelligent agent way of thinking about things, we would say that a system that did that was doing something essential and what you mean by being able to do something agential is that you have an abstracted view of the world that you can run forward in time. That you can run forward in time uh, faster than the real world and then take actions as as it were in advance of the things which were going to happen in the real world so you anticipate what happens in the world rather than reacting to it okay so now i want all of that to just happen spontaneously for nothing for free right okay. that it, that's not something that requires you to, to build you know a, a neural network or a deep order correlator or something like that or to evolve machinery that does it, that that's just something that happens for free in the natural world. Okay. And the way I'm going to get there is through uh, harmonic resonance. So in figure C, 
we have one um, causal process at the top of the figure, a cycle, you know, just a cyclic attractor. Something's happening in the world that's a cyclic attractor. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing that's happening in the world looks like there's different things. You know, there are black particles and white particles and they're not in the same space at the same time. You know, there's stuff happening in the world. But it turns out there are symmetries in the world that in a sense, you know, the black particle and the white particle are different from each other. They're different particles and different points in space and time. But really, they're not so different from each other because they're also both particles, both in the same space of entities. They're, in a sense, a reflection of one another. They might be um, not the same, but they're also not different in every respect. And that symmetry means that the cycle, the causal loop that they are in, can uh, collapse, twist, collapse, twist, and fold in such a way that it creates a loop of half the size where everything is going around twice as fast, a doubling of the frequency. That's the model where the symmetry between the black particle and the white particle has been collapsed into that's just particles like this is a general model of particles it doesn't care about whether it's a black particle or a white particle i can run that general model turn that general model through time to see what will happen in the next time step faster because it's a higher frequency model like i go around that once i've actually gone around in the real world twice right and as that loop then unfolds to unpack the symmetry that was in it, to split that symmetry back out into an unfolding and connect it back to the world, I've made something which is a, a influencing the real world in a way which you can think of as anticipating what would happen. But you can also think of it as, well, these are just two uh, symmetries in the world which coexist at the same time and influence one another in both directions simultaneously. Ah, still nodding. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, so now I'm just going to do that through multiple levels in figure D. All right. So it's, you know, you start with, there are, there are many different things in the world. You fold them up once that creates a sort of uh, lower dimensional model. You fold them up again, that creates a lower dimensional model. You fold them up again, all the way down, all the way down to what? At the bottom of everything, it's like uh, everything is the same thing. Like there's only one electron in the universe mm -hmm. and time isn't even really a thing. Like nothing really changes. Everything's the same. Nothing, there's nothing actually happening. And as you come back up the other side, unfolding, 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 all of the symmetries are broken and all of the complexity and diversity of physics, life, the universe, and everything is recreated back again. And all of those levels are there simultaneously, and all of those levels are connected. But they're not connected in an arbitrary way, they're connected in a specific way, which is to do with folding of removing one dimension from uh, the space at a time, folding it in a line of symmetry that, that retains as much of the local integrity that you had at one level is maintained as you fold it into the next level. And that in musical terms, each fold is a two to one octave, a two to one relationship. Right? Um, so I don't think that this is just a model of what happens in physics, right? What, you know, super symmetry stuff that happens in quarks and stuff. I think that that's, this that stuff that happens at that kind of level of physics is the same as the stuff that we were talking about in figure a uh mm -hmm. and that you know that arises spontaneously even when you do something simple like bow a violin string the violin string is imbued with agency when you do that and its ability to act agentially on the world is not very much, but it's not nothing. And I can tell you the story about how it does that if you're ready. Yeah, sure. All right. 
<clears throat> so let's say that the violin string is not vibrating to start with, and we start dragging the bow along the string. What's happening? There are microscopic disorganized um, uh, um, uh, interactions between the bow and the string. Um, they're not in phase with one another. They're not at the natural frequency of the string. They're, you know, they're far away from the natural frequency of the string, but they're putting a little bit of energy into it, almost like, you know, just sort of heat at that stage, right? Now, they are going to start resonating in the string. The, the resonant frequencies that build up in the string, notice that they involve top-down and bottom-up causation at the same time, because the frequencies that build up in the string depend on the macro scale geometry of the string, like its length. Mm -hmm. And they also depend on the micro scale properties of the material that it's made of, like the elastic bonds between the molecules at that particular tension. Mm -hmm. And those bottom up and top down determine mm -hmm. which frequencies build up in the string and which frequencies don't. And the energy which is going into the string is converted into organized uh, oscillations, which stack up and form simultaneously at all of those levels. Um, what's interesting, though, is that in so doing, the string pushes back on the bow, and it changes the nature of the interface between the bow and the string. How does it do that? Well, what you needed in order to play the fundamental frequency, this massive long wavelength frequency, that's uh, that you get when the playing is when the stroke of the bow is in full flow, as it were, when the string is singing loudly. What you need is to convert the linear motion of the bow into a reciprocal motion of the string. Like, how do you do that? Right. I mean, the bow is just pushing it, but it needs to push the string when the string is going that way. And it needs to not push the string when the string is coming back. So the string is organizing the stick and slip dynamics with the bow. It's allowing the bow to push it when it's stuck. And once the tension builds up, it slips. It joins to a different part of the bow, a little, a little tick backwards, which then drags it forward again in the right direction. So that you have, in a sense, a percussive motion of the bow. The, the linear drawing of the bow is turned into a percussive motion of the bow almost as though the string doesn't see the whole bow. It only sees intervals on the bow that are the right distances apart for it to drive the fundamental. So the string is organizing the way the interface that was providing the energy to give it energy at the right intervals that sustain the fundamental. Once the fundamental is going, it's sort of obvious that it does that, but it had to create the fundamental in order to push back in that specific organized way. The, the disorganized energy is converted into an organized energy that controls in a quantized way the interaction between the string and the bow in such a way that it sustains the uh, fundamental, which wasn't even there to start with. And I think, but I haven't heard anybody say it, that the agency of the string is of the, or rather of the stack of harmonics in the string is non-zero because it has the ability to compensate for small fluctuations in the stick and slip dynamics that are needed to drive the fundamental. So if a slip, if one of the slips was a little bit too long or a little bit too short, the, the next slip would be just right to compensate for that because the string will take energy from the higher frequency dynamics and push them, convert them between those levels to do the right amount of compensation for the next stick and slip. Hmm. Yep. Still nothing. <laughs> yep, sounds, sounds good so far. Uh, so the, what I'm, what I'm suggesting then is that living things are resonators like the string is, uh, but they have better sustain. 
Mm -hmm. right? Why do they have better sustain? Because they're more agential. Why do they more agential? Because that's what it means to be more agential is to have better sustain. It means that you have the ability to convert energy between different levels of organization. Because that converting energy between different level, levels of organization is the agency diagram that we started with in A, right? It's the ability to abstract the world, to take something which is happening at one frequency and convert it into another frequency, run that model of the world forward in time, um, and then act on the world based on the results of running that model, as it were. The reason that organisms have better sustain than strings is because you can set up multiple different harmonics in an organism uh, and not just the octave relationships, right? When you skip levels with the with other intervals like the third or the fourth, um, you're making uh, bindings between different levels, which converts energies from one level to a, skipping a few levels to another level more easily and quickly, which makes them more powerful, more agential. It also gives them sort of, um, it's the same thing as saying that they have more internal geometry to hold on to and more internal energy to deploy in maintaining that geometry. Yes. So one living organism, which we notionally think of as being created from a genotype is really an unfolding of compressed information into multiple different instantiations in a distribution of population, right? And selection we can think of as the folding process, which uh, collapses the information from that distribution back to genetic modifications. But that expansion and compression in biology, in conventional biology, we think that that has feed forward, feed forward, feed forward, feed forward, up to phenotype, and then feedback, 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 just in one step, right? The organism lives or dies and that's it. But it's mm -hmm. not like that. That, that feed forward and feedback is happening in the construction of the intracellular uh, organelles from the genotype, but they are already pushing back on the genotype to say which genes should be expressed. And in the construction of the cell from those organic molecules, but the cell is already pushing back on the organic molecules, which are pushing back on the genes from the cells into the tissues, which are differentiating into into tissues, but it's the organ which is already controlling how the cells differentiate, which is controlling how the intracellular components, metabolites and proteins are operating, which is controlling how the genes are being expressed, which is even modifying how the what the gene sequence is. All of those different levels are selves, are agents in the process of development um, just as much as the organism as a whole is. And the feedbacks are happening at multiple timescales and multiple organizations, not just in that sort of conventional loop. That's it. That's wonderful. That's, I, I agree. Um, at, at, <clears throat> I can make a few few comments in yes, terms please. of- So, at the very start, you talked about we needed to have a, something that was going to be, you know, effectively computationally universal, right? So that it can do all this stuff, right? And yet we want, if if we want to turn these ideas into a, a mathematically precise theory, we need some kind of precise but minimal mathematical structure to try to capture your ideas, right? <clears throat> and the 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 simplest and yet completely general, except for one little exception we can talk about, uh, model, mathematical model for these kinds of probabilistic interactions that we're talking about would be Markov, Markov kernels, right? That, that would be, they, they are the minimal mathematical way to talk about these probabilistic interactions. And it's trivial to show that Markov kernels are computationally universal. So you, mm -hmm. networks of Markov kernels uh, can do anything that neural networks can do. Mm -hmm. 
Now, it, it's it, the reason I've been nodding is that we're writing a paper on this <laughs> using Markov kernels. And this is uh, the papers uh, I've been writing it just the last few days, last actually a few weeks, um, and probably be at it for another month or two. We're going to call it traces of consciousness. And and there's a key idea that that really is a mathematical concomitant of what you're saying here. And and so what we've discovered is a new property of Markov kernels. They are partially ordered. There is a hierarchy of these kernels, just like you have a hierarchy of these interacting agents. And, and the hierarchy has a very clean definition. So if you have a Markov kernel, and just to be precise in case somebody out of this group looks at this video, right? We may post this and so forth. So suppose, so I'll be very concrete. Suppose I have a, a kernel that's a 10 by 10 matrix, right? And to be a Markov kernel, each row uh, consists of numbers between zero and one, and the sum of the numbers in that row is one. That's, that's, that's what I mean. So it's a Markov kernel. Very, very simple. Square matrix, each row sums to one. They're all positive numbers between zero and one. If you, if I, I can run one of these kernels, right? I can see if it's on 10 states, I can see, you know, if it's in state one, what's the probability it goes to state two through 10 and so forth. Or if it stays at state one, I can just, so I can look at its dynamics. And ultimately, if it's um, an ergodic kernel, I can find a stationary measure. I can see long-term probability of being in state one, two, three through 10, right? But I can also do something else. I can say, I only want to look at states one, two, and three. So I'm running the bigger kernel, but I'm ignoring, I'm only attending to states one, two, and three. So if I only do that, what is the Markov kernel that I would apparently see only involving one, two, and three, right? Which would be induced by the bigger one. That's in, in technical terms, it's called a trace chain. So in mathematics, so there's a formula for it. Uh, I can, it's a, it, if you want, I can put the formula up on the screen, but it's, there's a, a formula for it. It, it, it involves, the, the mathematics involves uh, looking essentially at infinitely long sequences of, of chains of, of, of the big one and seeing how often they go out of the three that you're interested in and go and then go into it and, and so forth. But, but it turns out if you look at that infinite sequence, uh, you can give a closed form solution for it. So you don't have to do anything infinite. You can do a closed form solution that captures this infinite sequence. So, so here's the, the, the partial order. It's defined by one kernel M is less than or equal to another kernel N if and only if M is a trace chain of N. That's it. That simple. It gives you a non-Boolean logic on every possible dynamics. In other words, all possible dynamics are now given a, an, a, an order relationship and a logic. It's a non-Boolean logic. It has no global um, greatest element. And it has many, many elements are incomparable. So, you know, many dynamics are not less than or equal to each other. They're, they're incomparable. But if you take one kernel and you look at all of the kernels that are less than that one kernel, just look at that subset of, of dynamics, they are a Boolean logic. So you get a Boolean logic. So what this allows is... And by the way, when you when you take a kernel like this 10 by 10 and you look at the three by three that comes you know from a trace, and you look at the probabilities on those three states, the transition, they're utterly different from they, what they were on the 10 by 10. As far as you could tell, this is an utterly new kernel. It, it, if you were thinking about the probabilities as free will, the free will decisions of the three by three are utterly different in their probabilities than the free will decisions on the same states of the 10 by 10. In other words- They can be, not they have to be, right? They, they, in, in fact, they have to be different in general. All right. 
in general, they they will be different with probability one. I think they'll be be different. I haven't proven that, but just intuitively, it seems like with probability one, they will be different. So what you get is this really, from one trivial definition, n less than m, if n is a trace of m. That's it. This whole beautiful logic falls out. Now, of course, these kernels have, if you look at their eigenfunctions, you, you are going to find their vibration rates. And, and in fact, in, in the paper that, um, that we're publishing, I'm, I'm looking at what, what you can do is take these kernels, a regular Markov kernel, and just add one little feature to it, which is standard in Markov chain theory. Um, you add a little counter that increments every time you take a step of the chain. So you start off at zero and it goes one, two, three, four. So it's called a space-time chain, right? So you have the normal chain, but you then have this quote-unquote time parameter, uh, which you uh, add to it. It's called a space-time. And you can now take the, the eigenfunctions of that space-time kernel, okay? And when you do it, what you get is, is a, a function which is identical in form to the um, quantum mechanical wave function for uh, a free particle. It's a momentum eigenstate for free particles. I exactly. So we're going to show this. I, I'm, I'm, we'll give examples. So, so if you want vibrations, you got vibrations here. You got all possible vibrations. You have an organization that, that you know, a logic that ties all of them together in one beautiful symphony. And it, there's no single greatest at the top. This is a hierarchy. It's really, really quite interesting. So, I mean, if I was to go spiritual and say, instead of saying there is the one, say one consciousness, there is, I would have to say the whole, because there isn't just the one, It's it, there is no greatest element. There is something far richer than that. So, I was nodding as I was going through because as you were going through all the stuff, I was ticking off on this mathematics. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can. everything that you're you were saying here is a mathematical way to, to do it. Now I, I said there was one proviso. Here's the proviso. Um, Markov kernels are um, universal for any um, you know probabilistic process that has a finite memory. Hmm. Now that, that finite memory can be as big as you want. In other words, like when we define a Turing machine, right? We say uh, you, you, there's a tape and uh, the tape is as long as you need it to be. Hmm. And, and, as, and everybody goes, okay, well, I don't care about that. It, but there's no restriction here. It's the same thing with Markov chain. Yeah, it, it's finite, but it's as big as you want it to be, just like the Turing tape can be as long as you want it to be. So in practice, uh, it's it's universal. In practice, it's universal, and so 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 we're we're working on on this. It's called the the trace order and the trace logic, and and then there's a a beautiful thing that comes out of it. Um, what we propose is so there's been a, a big open problem in science, and that is, please, what is an observer? What is an observer? In, in Newtonian physics, the observer was aloof, didn't affect what it was observing, and you didn't have you didn't need a model of it because you could ignore it. Mm -hmm. We now know that that's too simplistic. In Einstein, there is the observer. You have to use the notion of an observer, but it's really just a reference frame. It's a, a system of clocks and coordinates. That's all. There's no real deep theory of an observer. In quantum theory, now the observer comes front and center, right? Because the evolution of state in quantum theory is linear when the system is not observed. It's a Schrodinger equation, it's linear. When you observe, the change of state is nonlinear. You go from a superposition, a, you know, a, a complex superposition of eigenstates to a single eigenstate. That's nonlinear. That means you cannot use quantum theory to give you a model of the observer, period. Can't do it. The linear quantum apparatus cannot model it. 
And decoherence doesn't solve it at all because all decoherence does is it maps from a complex superposition of the um, eigenstates to a classical mixture of eigenstates, but it does not take you to a single eigenstate. So decoherence is a red herring. It doesn't do the job. There, there is no job that, that, that can be done using quantum theory. So, so that's why they've been pulling the hair out about the observer, okay? So, and, and Polly, you know, uh, Wolfgang Polly was said, you know, this is one of the big problems. In 1954, he said, this is a big problem. We, we need a theory of the observer. And, and, and then just two years ago, um, uh, Frank Wilczek said basically the same thing in an interview. So quantum theorists are still, what is an observer? And I actually went to a physics conference a few years ago in Banff where it was all about the role of the observer in, in physics, in, in quantum physics. And, and, oh, and by the way, saying, well, we won't talk about observers, we'll talk about measuring apparatuses measurement apparatuses, which is what Heisenberg did and Asher Paris did and a lot of people do. Well, we, we won't talk. Well, that solves nothing because the measurement apparatus must embody a nonlinear process. It has to be nonlinear. So you have the same problem. Whether you call it an observer or not, you can't do it with quantum mechanics. A measurement apparatus has no reductive explanation in, in quantum theory. So, so that's a big one of the big open problems in science. So here's what we propose. We, you know, we've talked about these agents being represented by Markov kernels and so forth. One agent observes another if it's a trace. End of story. The trace operation. If one kernel is a trace of the other, it is observing the bigger kernel. Now, now notice what this does it's, it's truly remarkable we we wanted to have observers that were independent aloof and don't affect the, the this is different if you observe you are an organic aspect of the very thing that you're observing you are you are intimately and organically not, not just looking at it you're you are part of it that's what this is saying so and, and that seems that seems right to me. That, that seems very very right. But so so this gives you a theory of observation. Now, what are the outcomes of observations? Right, you, there there are out observations and then there are outcomes. And so how does so I, I've I've said what an observer is and what an observation is. But now what are possible outcomes for this and and how do I model that? Right. And and so one interesting thing about Markov kernels, if they're ergodic and in, 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 unless they're periodic, um, so you need to be ergodic. You need to be aperiodic, right? And you need to have a single communicating class. So, and we can talk about the others because the others are really interesting, and I have some things to say about them. But, but let's let's just talk about ergodic ones because they're the 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 math that I, I'm at least on clean mathematical grounds, and I can say precisely what the answer is. For the ergodic ones, which are, are the bulk, um, you can talk about the what's called the stationary measure of the of the Markov chain. For example, for the ten by ten, the stationary measure is a probability measure on the ten states, and what it describes is the long term probability in being state one or being in state two all the way up through state n. So it it actually it, it solves the equation if. If, if the kernel is P, you know, capital P, and the stationary measure is mu, then mu P equals mu. That's the, that's the equation you have to solve. Mu P equals mu. Pretty straightforward. So that's the stationary measure. It gives you the long-term, in some sense, the long-term probability of what you're going to see, the outcome of your observation. Mm. So, so it turns out that we have this this non-Boolean logic on observers, the trace logic. Now we have, what we're proposing is, there's a map from the observers to these probability measures that are the stationary measures. So we need to ask ourselves, is there a logic 
on these probability measures, right? Because we would like to have effectively a logic homomorphism between the observers and the kinds of probabilistic beliefs that observers might have as a result of ob observation. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out there is a logic. And uh, I and a couple of collaborators published it 30 years ago. It's called the Lebesgue logic of probability measures. And that logic has also a trivial definition. So it, and the definition is that one probability measure mu is less than or equal to a probability measure nu if mu is a normalized restriction of nu, period. That's simple. So, so mu is, you know, it's on a subset of states of nu. And when you restrict nu to that subset of states, you get mu. That's all. That gives you an incredibly beautiful logic. It's again, non-Boolean. There is no greatest element. It's locally Boolean. If you take a particular probability measure and you look at all the probability measures that are less than it, then they form a Boolean logic. It's more general than the uh, orthomodular complemented uh, lattices of, of quantum uh, logic theory. So it's more, more general than that. And it turns out, we're, we're showing in this paper, that the map between this trace logic of the dynamical systems into this Lebesgue logic of probability measures, which is the, you know, the, the probabilistic beliefs that come out of it, is a homomorphism. So the whole thing ties up unbelievably beautiful. There's a homomorphism between obs observation and you know, probabilistic belief. So, and, and harmonic behavior is, that, is the core of it. When you actually look at these Markov kernels, that's, that's what you, you look at all the eigenfunctions, for example, of the space-time chains, or just of the regular kernels themselves. It's all about harmonics. Now, you know, what we're, so, so I'm, that's why I was nodding the whole time. I mean, everything yeah, me I'm saying, I would, I, I could say, here's the piece of mathematics that models that, that's, that's what models that. And it's, so, I mean, so I'm, I'm completely on, on board with what you're saying. And, and so there's this, a, a wonderful dialogue you know, to go for. Now, where to go, where we're trying to go with this. Can I, can I reflect sure. some, some additional um, sure. symmetries, which I noticed. So the word that I'm using for a, a stack of frequencies in harmonic relations is a song. Yes. The finite memory that you're talking about means that the song is always eventually cyclic, right? That it's going to, it's going to come around again, right? That it's, that it's a repeating thing, right? Not necessarily. Chaotic stuff stuff can happen out of finite systems. Uh. Okay, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. the trace in in my mind relates to what it means to um, resonate one song with another. So when one song meets another song and they resonate that means that the two songs have to share some frequencies in common. Otherwise, they can't resonate, right? Or have a harmonic relationship between those frequencies, right? Absolutely. Mm. And the uh, that means that in order to observe, in order for one song to be sensitive to another song, they both have to be drawn from the same super song, right? They have to be uh, harmonically related to one another. Otherwise, they can't be observed. And the ability to observe the detail or agential nature of one song requires an agent, an observer, which is just as agential, which has the same harmonic relationships between it. Yes, that's right. And it's it's not just a question of saying, you know, can you measure all the frequencies which are in this song, like like a Fourier decomposition does. Because you say, you know, it's got it's got a lot of this frequency and it's got a lot of that frequency there. I measured it, right? It's like, right. no, you didn't really see it yet because that frequency and that frequency, you know, they, they're not really different from that frequency and that frequency that's moved a little bit, but that's completely different. That's a completely different thing. Why is it a completely different thing? Because these were in the octave relationship and those weren't, right? Exactly. Right, right. Because you're not just seeing the frequencies that are in it, you're seeing the relationships between the frequencies. Absolutely. That see that you need to be the octave, not just have the two frequencies in it. 
That's right. The way that we capture that kind of intuition in this trace logic is when we have a when you have a logic, there's what's called the meet and the join of of two entities, right? The and and the or. So the yeah. meet is the and, the the join is the or. But but they call it meet and join. Now, if you have two Markov kernels and they both have say they both have ten states, but but seven of the states are different, and they only share three states between them, right? So this guy has ten states. This guy has ten states. They share three states, but each has seven different states, right? That that that. For most of the time, if you, if you just give me two random kernels like that, they are incomparable because they they do not agree on the states where they overlap. Which means they can't observe each other. They can't observe each other. They can't form a join. They can't form a meet. They mm. are incomparable. Apples but and oranges. <laughs> the apples and oranges, and and most of them are right. The yeah. probability of that is very very high. Yeah, but if they do, if you have the two the ten by tens, for example, they overlap in three, and but they do have a meet, so they do agree, and there is a trace that they both share on those. On the, they both share the same trace chain on those three states. Then you can take their union. There, you can take their join, and what that does is it then um, there are new transitions because there were no transitions before the seven extra states of the first guy and the seven extra states of the second guy never had any direct communication before, Before, right? In, yeah. But when you make the join, the new kernel has all the right co connections between them to make the whole thing harmonious, to, to, yeah, to make, make the it, right song. A chemistry that makes a new thing, it, it reacts. Right? And it's unique in general. So there's a unique right song that melds the two original songs if they overlap. So, it, so, so that's why I was nodding all the time. Your your intuitions are really being captured. So so it, it, crudely, this meet and join, it's like the inner and outer product. And if and you do it properly, it's like the Clifford algebra, right? With the wedge product. That would be, I would love to prove that. That, that I mean, I've been thinking about that. Um, and I, I've, I wrote down actually, an order relationship on geometric algebra entities as well. And I think that it may be homomorphic to these logics as well. So there may be, so, 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 so yes, I've been looking in that direction and I actually a few, few months ago gave a paper to Chaitan, my, my mathematical collaborator with a partial order on Clifford algebras which mm. I should go back and look at it because it may be homomorphic to this, which which case would be really so, funny. So that's a so great my, So my intuition says that it is because the through from the songs and the frequencies, you can get to the Lissuju figures. And from the Lissuju figures, you can get to the shapes and geometries. And then yeah. the interaction of two songs is the geometric algebra that converts one shape into another shape. Yes, yes. That, 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 no, I, I'm completely on board. And I should pull out that piece of paper again that I sent to Chaitan and, and go over that logic. That would and be then, fun, actually. I might even want to include that in the paper we're doing right now, but just point that out. That's, that's yeah. So the, um, the computational part, uh, in my mind, is that when you, when you um, strobe a song at a particular frequency and it looks discrete, if you've got the right frequency, it looks like a nice orbit or it looks like a another Lissajou figure and it's, it's stationary if you if you strobe it at the right combination of frequencies uh that that structure that uh structure that it describes uh has a correspondence with the lambda calculus too uh -huh. so that you can you can describe what a song is the discrete the discrete stationary structure of a song when viewed at a particular frequency is a program and the interaction of two songs can be described as the application of one song to another as the application of one lambda calculus expression to another lambda calculus expression to create an output. Well, that that I would be very interested to see. That that would be lovely and that would be new to me. That would be very new to me. So I would I would really anything that you could send me on that I would be most most interested. Yeah, I did just intuitive at the moment. Sure, sure. <laughs> but 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 also intuitively when you look so if you look at um a Markov kernel and you look at one that is periodic. So every row is all zeros except 
there's a single element that has a one. And it's, and then, you know, you cycle through the N states in some order, one, right. one through N. And, and, and you, so, so that has a, a specific clean frequency, right? Now, suppose you take um, a, another Markov chain that's also zero one, but it's also on 10 states, say, but it's a different, different order. And now you add the two and, 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 and wait it. So maybe 0.3 of one and plus 0.7 of the other. Well, now you have a Markov kernel, which is now ergodic. It's now an ergodic kernel, but it actually has two basic frequencies. And if you keep doing this, you realize that all these ergodic kernels are really just sums of these frequencies of, of basic kernels. That's what that's that's what you're really, and you're just weighting them. So so each one of these complicated kernels is a complex harmonic score of all possible frequencies that are going on. And you could have sub-frequencies, and they don't all have to be in frequency of 10. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's, it's it's quite rich that way. Awesome. So the how do you speak to the interest in whether you know the so the Markov kernels and their ability to interact or relate to one another, you know, interacting is really just seeing what the relationship is between them, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you speak to the possibility of those the the origination of those kernels? and how they come to have information that's, um, shall we say, uh, uh, intelligent, in, in capable of producing intelligent action. Well, the first thing to note, again, as we talked about before, is that the, the Markovian kernels are computationally universal. Sure, so they could be anything, they, but they how, do be anything. Get, how do they get to be something specific? W well, my guess is that anything that's possible is actual. <laughs> Why? Why not? Any so I think this entire trace order and all the possible kernels is um, a. <clears throat> I'll put it this way: I think reality is no less complicated than that. It's probably much. My own attitude about scientific theories is everything we've thought of so far is trivial compared to reality, including my, my, the current theory that I put out there. It's trivial compared to reality. But, so, but I would say that reality, whatever it is, is at least as complicated as the entire trace logic and all the possible kernels on it. And we're seeing just a little bit piece of it. Yeah. So, I mean, that, I, think I'm, I think I'm okay with that. But in our little corner of the universe where, sure. we, where, we, have, <laughs> where we have some shared history, Yes. Uh, you know, and, you know, we can talk about the same space time and the same entities and the particles in it and shit like that. We we're interested in agents that know stuff about the world that, and right. and we're interested in the processes by which they came to know it yes. and what it means to be able to, you know, act in the world intelligently. Right. Yes. Right. So that is a, a very high priority on what stuff I'm doing right now to try to answer that question. And, and here's here's the direction that I'm going on. What I want to do is actually try to solve that kind of problem by showing that if I start with only this logic of, the trace logic of Markov kernels, I can build space-time and quantum physics and general relativity out of it mm -hmm. as a headset, basically, that certain of these conscious agents use to interact with others. So that's, so that's, now, to do that is a non-trivial thing. I, I want to use the architecture of these Markovian kernels as a computational architecture now, like a neural network, to build, to actually build a space-time as a, as a user interface, to answer, to, as a way to answer your question. Now, to do that, I, I really am going to ultimately have to get a mapping from the Markovian dynamics that I've been talking about into... Um, space, uh, you know, a model of space-time you know, with quantum field theory and the whole bit. Now, mm -hmm. fortunately, we have some help in this from high-energy theoretical physicists just in the last decade. And, and here's what they've done. They realized a few decades ago that space-time cannot be fundamental. 
Mm -hmm. It falls apart at the Planck scale. So it's not fundamental. And David Gross wrote a paper in 2005, uh, you know, the the centennial of Einstein's discovery of special relativity. So it was a, you know, in, in honor of Einstein, said, thank you, Einstein, for space time. And then uh, David Gross then went on to say, space time is doomed. Thank you, Einstein, for giving us space time, but space time is doomed. It cannot be fundamental. And we need to, so in, in the, the intervening almost 20 years, they've gone at it. And in the last 10 years, they found new structures entirely outside of space-time. So they're, 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 these are not structures like curled up inside space-time like you think about in string theory. These are structures utterly beyond space-time and, by the way, utterly beyond quantum theory. There are no Hilbert spaces here. What they found, the, the new field is called the field of positive geometries. And the European Research Council just a few weeks ago um, launched a 10 million euro um, multinational collaboration, and they had their first conference just a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, Hundred over 100 mathematicians and mathematical physicists there, they, and I, I, it's called Universe Plus. You, if you go online and, and look up ERC Universe Plus, well, it's all caps, Universe, and then a plus sign at the end of it, you can read their very ambitious statement. We're basically saying we're going outside of space-time, beyond quantum theory, we're using positive geometries for a new foundation for physics. So physicists have realized space-time is not fundamental. And in the last decade, they've stepped outside of space-time. The positive geometries are things like amplitudehedra, associahedra, cosmological polytopes. And then... And those are just words I've heard, but yeah. <laughs> right, 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 but yeah, they're, 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 they're positive geometries. They, 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 it's really interesting. They're, they're like polytopes. In some cases, they are polytopes. But the, the amplitudehedron is not a polytope, but it's polytope-like, that they're positive geometries. And then they've also found these combinatorial objects that they can use to classify these, these positive geometries, and, and in particular, decorated permutations. So these are permutations with a little twist. If you're interested, I can tell you what the twist is. But, but for now, I'll just leave it as decorated permutations. If you want, I'll tell you what the twist is. But what what we found so yeah don't so worry I'm not going to say that's not a decorated permutation <laughs> <laughs> it's not decorated enough for me <laughs> this question is that who ordered that and why right and uh -huh. and and so here's what we're up to we have these Markovian dynamics we have this trace logic and the Lebesgue logic and so forth we've already made connection with the decorated permutations we actually said. If decorated permutations classify these positive geometries, can they classify our Markovian dynamics? And you know, I can send you a paper. We we published that. Yes, they do. And and what they and when we did the classification, what it said was the thing you want to look at are the recurrent classes. That's what corresponds to particles in physics. So that 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 one step already told us where to look in making this map from the. Markovian dynamics to to particle you know representation in space time. These recurrent communicating classes correspond to particles. So it's, if you're going to build intelligent agents, you're going to have to build space time particles and all the rest of it first, and then build intelligent agents out of that. We want to do it if we want to do it in 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 a what looks like a physicalist matter. Sure, mm. I, I think of these these conscious agents as already intelligent agents. Mm. So basically, it's building a space time is only to build a way of of sort of giving a physicalist instantiation of this intelligence. And the reason we have to do that, by the way, is that's where we can make experimental tests. Right? It's only inside space time that we can test our theories. So I have to project this theory of conscious agents into space time. Otherwise, it's just airy fairy mathematics, untestable. So our goal is to is to precisely predict the momentum distributions of quarks and gluons inside the proton using this this to to actually show how space-time arises so precisely and what a quark and gluon is from our theory that we predict exactly to 10 decimal places the momentum distributions of of of, of quarks and gluons inside protons then then the theory is probably it's still not right but at least it should be taken seriously so that's that's what we're up to I see that does sound hard. Uh, you got to do it. I mean, it, <laughs> nothing, nothing less is science, right? You, you, if you have to go big or go home, there's no reason for anybody to take this theory seriously if we can't make a prediction that you can test at the Large Hadron Collider, for example.
And the reason, by the way, we're going there is because those are the simplest predictions that we can make. Single quarks and gluons or small numbers. If I look at the brain, now I'm talking about quadrillions of quarks and gluons. Why should I start with quadrillions? Let me start with one or two and, sure. and then work my way up to quadrillions. So that's yeah. that's where but we're going. There. Maybe it's just as easy to start from the other end. Well, uh, and I, once we publish this paper, I hope some people try to use the I, my, my you know, I have a short life. I've got to pick. You have to pick what you think is your best bet and go for it. And my best bet is three or four gluons as opposed to a quadrillion is, is where I'm going to get the testable. Prediction. So I, I think of. Uh, rather than billing, it, it seems like you went from. From, uh, you know, there's only consciousness. There are special kinds of geometries and mathematical relationships out of which I can build space, time and particles. And then in space, time and particles, I could build complex assemblies of particles, which eventually would look something like consciousness. It would look something like an intelligent agent. It wouldn't, it's not the consciousness that created it all, but it's the, it's something that looks like it, that resembles agency and intelligence, right? Yeah, it, 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 well, it's, it's the, it's the headset that we use. We build the headset that we use and the headset gives us more or less insight into the consciousness behind, right? So, so on this point of view, I would, I would argue that the distinction we make between living and non-living is not principled. Sure. In, in the sense, so, so right now we're on a Zoom and I, I'm seeing you only through a screen and some of the pixels are pixels of your face and there are other pixels of a wall and a, and a picture behind you. Now, the, the, the pixels on the wall give me no insight into consciousness whatsoever. The pixels of your face give me quite a bit of insight into what you're thinking and, and your expressions and what you understand or don't understand or agree or disagree. Now, if I would just, were to say, aha, that means that there are some conscious pixels and some unconscious pixels, that's, that's a really dumb mistake. And it's the same mistake that we make when we distinguish between conscious physical objects and unconscious physical objects. It's exactly the same mistake. We're, we're, it's, it's not a principal distinction we're making. So we're always interacting with consciousness, but a headset dumbs things down. That's what it does. It's, that's what it's for. And so sometimes it, it reveals less about the consciousness and sometimes it reveals more because it's dumbing things down. And we then make a category error and say, oh, those, a rock is not conscious and the human body is. No, th that's just the wrong way of thinking about it. Yeah. No pixel in the headset is conscious or unconscious, living or, or, or non-living. Right. So, I, could, I could communicate with you as a conscious agent through a communication channel that only allowed Morse code, that only allowed a single bit at a time. Or I could communicate with you as a conscious agent through a rich yeah. multidimensional interface in many frequencies simultaneously. Exactly. Um, exactly. I get that. Sure. So I, I think about uh, learning and intelligence in in ordinary physical Newtonian systems uh, in a very simplistic way, right? So I have this model uh, that I call natural induction, where you have a system of particles connected by springs, and yes. the the interactions of the of the particles with one another or with an external environment creates tensions in the springs. And if those springs are slightly plastic, then the springs deform in a way that changes the energy function of the particles. And you can show that it changes in exactly the same way that you would expect Hebb's rule to modify the connections of a neural network. Hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. So that the network becomes uh, a model of its own history in such a way that it can then anticipate the uh, original energy function and find better solutions to the problem of constraints that were originally yes. put in the in the in the uh, weights. Uh, so if it's if it all that's really happening is that you're allowing the forcing on the system to deform its internal arrangement. You know how did it get smart? It was pushed, right? It was it was just pushed. Well, that's not smart. Like, you know, I can make an imprint in clay and it's a record, but it's not smart. Right, right. The thing that makes it smart is the folding of the space, right? That the, your, the compression of the, the symmetries in the way in which it was pushed, whether that's over time or over space, are folded into an idealized 
compressed representation of what happened. And then when that pushes back, it looks like it's doing something smart because it's doing coordinated action, which is informed by that past history. Yes. It's not really anticipating anything. Um, I like to think of it as um, it's just reacting, not anticipating. But mm -hmm. when everything is circular, whenever when all activity is circular and periodic, being just the right amount of late is the same as anticipating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so smart uh, entities, entities that are intelligent, are are modified by their history and pushing back on the world as a reaction with just the right amount of late that they look like they're anticipating. You can't really tell whether time is going forwards or backwards. Right. But I think that you can do that with ordinary particles and springs at the macro scale without any quantum funniness going on. And that, that that's actually that the, 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 the violin string is, is intelligent in this, in the same way, like on the same scale, but not the same amount in the same way as, as, uh, uh, as other kinds of, um, should we say, um, intelligences we find more relatable. I was going to, I was, I was tempted to say better intelligences. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, um, so, so that, so that I don't have to build it from the quarks up, right? I can start at any level of organization, and the thing that makes it smart is the relationships between a few different levels connected together. Does that make sense? Well, oh, oh, it, it absolutely does. And uh, there, there, there's a couple levels of which I would think about that. One is that I, I can model this with just the Markovian kernels outside of space-time in, in an interesting way. I could say I've got this big, say I could say a 10 by 10 again, and I, I have this other, um, say a five by five, and they share three states. And in some sense, so the, the 10 by 10 is more complicated than the five by five, but if they actually share three states and, and they're compatible, then in some sense, when I join them, I, I can get a resonance of, of the big dynamics now it gets resonated into the, the smaller one and it, it has a more compact representation. So within this trace logic, I can begin to formally do uh, with mathematical precision, the kind of thing that you're doing and, and looking at it that way. Mm. So that's what one one direction. But now looking at it, it things inside space time, it seems to me. Well, first I should say, outside of space time, these Markovian kernels, the dynamics need not have increasing entropy. The entropy can be constant at each step, mm -hmm. which means there need not be an arrow of time in the the basic Markovian dynamics beyond space-time. Mm. But it's a theorem. When you take a slice of them, there is an entropy, right? Mm. That's right. When you when you lose any information in a projection, you get, as an artifact of that loss of information, the entropy increases. Mm. Now, in evolution, the fundamental limited resource is time. If you don't mate in time, you don't reproduce. If you don't eat in time, you die. If you don't breathe in time, you die. Time is the fundamental limited resource. My guess is that the arrow of time that we see inside space-time is not an insight into a deeper reality at all. It's entirely, 100%, an artifact of loss of information. And that means that our entire picture... But by, by the way, let me preface what I'm about to say with this. I love... Darwin's theory. And I've done a lot of work on Darwin's theory. It's a it's the best theory that we have of biological evolution. There's nothing close to it. So let me just put that right out there. Now, every scientific theory has its limits, everyone. And my claim is that all of Darwin's theory is an artifact of the loss of information from in the project, projection into space-time. And that means that the the distinction that we make between organisms and resources and, and uh, all of that, the whole thing, competing nature, red and tooth and claw, all of it is not an insight into a deeper reality beyond space time. Every bit of it is an artifact of the limitations of our headset, period. Nothing, no insight. Yeah. So, so that's why 
looking inside space-time for the evolution of intelligence may be the wrong thing. That's the wrong, in that framework. Oh, yeah, but I'm not looking for the evolution of intelligence. Good, good, good. No. Then, then we're on the same no. page. Right. Evolution, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, evolution is a product of intelligence, not the, not the, not the process that creates it. So it's, it's a product of, of the loss of information about the way intelligence really works. Yeah. So, you know, when you, when, when harmonic relationships are set up in a resonator, they're already cognitive. You didn't need any natural selection for that, right? Right, right? right, exactly, right. When you view it at a particular time slice, a particular strobe, when you look at it with another song, it'll look like a discrete object that's reproducing. Right? Yes. Uh, the uh, When you view one octave with another octave, what you see is the, instead of a big loop that twists in folds on itself and then unfolds back into a big loop, it appears to do a big loop that folds and twists and divides and creates two. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so when you, when you view one octave with another octave, that's a little bit off, you get this sort of continuous expansion of, you know, creating stuff out of stuff out of stuff. Right. And it has, this, it has this weird property that you, it looks like you took something and you broke it in half, but the two halves that you have, they're not halves, they're holes. Right. How did that right. happen? Right. And it's, you know, yes. it's because the whole is, is already folded inside. Right. It, it's, it feels sort of preformationist, but that's what harmonics yes. are. Right. The whole is already folded into all of the parts in a sort of. Holiday. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. Mm. Yeah, I agree. No, that, that's and I think th those intuitions can be cashed out in, with pr this precise mathematics. I, I have not done that, but but I but I would be a, a, a direction that I would agree is a very fascinating direction. So I wonder, I wonder if there's something, I wonder what, you know, basically I'm wondering what's left for me to add, right? If you've already done all the math, because <laughs> I'm, because I'm working at an intuitive level, uh, but you've already done all the maths. So I wonder if there's, if there's something in that notion of how a physical system can come to have knowledge of an environment just through an ordinary Newtonian sort of deformation of its internal structure that's, you know, it's just a ball rolling downhill. It's just local energy minimization, which puts knowledge into it if it has this folded structure. So there's two levels of, of architecture happening at once. Uh, so that it's not just a language in which you can write intelligent things, but it's a, it's a description of the process that puts the intelligence into it as well. Well, first, I, I don't want to give the impression that we've solved everything. Uh, I mean, that's that's that not the impression I want to give. I I I think that we've we've taken a first step in what's going to be a, a I think a really interesting and long journey. But we, just a first baby step is is the way I look at it. For example, I can't tell you yet how to model uh, even a quark in in our theory outside of space time. Right. So all all, all the fun work is is ahead still um, on that and. I mean, we have hints, right? So I, I can say that what what some of the hints are to try to make this kind of connection into into space time. One is we 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 propose and we do this in in uh, in the paper that I'm writing right now that the mass of a particle corresponds to the entropy rate of the Markovian, of the recurrent communicating class of the Markovian kernel that it is a projection of. So the, the entropy rate is, so the, a kernel, each row is a probability measure, right? Each row is a probability measure. So you can talk about the entropy of each row. Um, so, so, that, so each row has its own entropy. And then you, if, you, if it's an ergodic kernel, you have a, a stationary measure. So you have a probability measure for each row. So you can just add up all the entropies weighted by their stationary measure, and it's called the entropy rate. So it's a very, very simple, it's, it's a nice clean notion of the um, of, of the entropy of the entire kernel. And we propose that that is what corresponds to mass in physics. Mm. Entropy rate, it's telling you how much each state, the, the entropy rate of a of, of the system is, is telling you effectively how influential it is, mm. right? If, if you have all zeros and ones, 
then then you you don't don't hardly influence anybody else. You only influence one thing. So your influence. So that's and that's going to be zero entropy. So if if you have if if you have a bunch of zeros and a one in a row, well that row has zero entropy. It's going to have no influence. Mm. It has no mass. So and that that entropy will be. Uh, so that's you're only ever seeing the entropy of a particular projection, right? Like because right that's you're right. not you're not seeing the true entropy or the true mass right and that's going to be really important when we, we um empirical tests of our theory because we need to actually understand the statistics of the of this partial sampling process that's going to happen so the trace chains are as i mentioned they're assuming an infinite trace but we will have finite traces and what we what we plan to show is uh, that 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 makes a difference in what we get in our physics so at the quarks and gluons inside the proton, I'll just mention. <clears throat> when you <clears throat> look at the porosis spatial and temporal scales inside the proton, what they call Bjork and X, which is the temporal scale, and, and Q squared, which is the spatial scale, <clears throat> you see three valence quarks, two up quarks and a down quark. As you start to get finer and finer spatial and temporal resolution, you see a bunch of quark, anti-quark pairs, what they call a quark C, and a bunch of gluons, a gluon, an ocean of gluons. And then as you continue to go even further down, you get just an, an ocean of gluons. It's just like seething gluons, and that's all you see. How do we, how are we going to explain that kind of thing? Well, quarks are fermions, they're massive particles, and gluons are massless. They have no mass. So, so they're traveling at the speed of light inside a proton. So that it's frenetic. The inside of a proton is frenetic because there are particles traveling back and forth at the speed of light inside this tiny, tiny little thing. This is truly a seething thing. Now, what is a massless particle in our theory? It corresponds to a matrix, a Markov matrix that has only zeros and ones. So, so we actually, given our definition of entropy rate being mass, we we now know what massive part, what massless particles are. The massless spin one particles are particles that are periodic. Mm. That's the, so it comes right out of. So you can start to see we start to get this really beautiful dictionary. Now, what happens when we start trying to build up a trace chain at really really high temper? So really time small time samples and really fine resolution. Well, you, the way you're gonna do it is you're gonna to have to sample. So I, oh, oh, I got this state, now I got this state, and I got this state. So now I can start to figure out, okay, there's the probability of going from this state to this state. Now from this, so I can start to build up. What am I gonna see? My initial matrices are gonna be zeros and ones because that's just, I don't have enough data to, to do anything finer. But that's not an insight into the nature of reality. That's sampling error. Mm. And that's what we're gonna claim about the gluon C, when they look at the proton in very, very high resolution, or we're getting closer and closer to reality. No, what you're seeing is entirely sampling error. So doesn't <laughs> that gluon C, I've never heard the expression before, but doesn't that gluon C end up looking like something that's a continuum with very, that's almost like it has, like in that C, there are waves that are of much lower frequency that it, that connects it right back up to the top level. I think so. I think that there's all sorts of weird structures that you can see, and, and really unusual. Um, I forgot what they call these kinds of weird dynamics that they have down down at that level. But there are some unusual dynamics. So it's not just noise. It's it's noise mm. with some kind of unusual coherence to it, which is perhaps what you would expect when this is a sampling from something deeper that does have coherence. Yeah. It's sampling error that, on something deeper. That's like asking, um, you know, that the, the the tiny vibrations between the bow and the string are are you know they're just a they're just heat, right? You know, they're just a sea of uh, incoherent mm -hmm. microscopic influences. So how come then, when you add them all up, they become this fundamental, right? So they weren't tiny incoherent things. They actually they had structure to them because otherwise they wouldn't create. That's right. The, the stick slip dynamics of the particular structure, right? They're that's right. They can't be. They would all cancel out if they would if they didn't have any if they didn't have any structure to them. That's right. So if this is a sampling of a 
pre-existing kernel, there is a structure to that kernel which is going to effective. As you get more and more sampling, you'll begin to see the harmonic structure of the underlying kernel. Absolutely. By the way, um, uh, um, we're, we have money to hire one or two postdocs who have recent PhDs in algebraic geometry and know these positive geometries. So we're about to put the word out, but if you know any bright young new PhDs in mathematics um, um, who know algebraic geometry. That's, we... that's not the kind of PhD I know. I can barely do matrix multiplication myself. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, if I if I come across any, I'll, I'll let you know. Yes, thank you. Uh, if um, what would be the reverse? If you have, uh, if you had people that could do that kind of maths, but understood the biology, you would want them to stay with you and do that kind of maths. Uh, it's yes. The um, for me, it's the I I would like to explore those um those relationships between uh, shape and form of the of the Clifford algebra, the sort of geometric algebra, the lambda calculus, you know, universal programming language, and mm -hmm. the um the adaptive processes, so processes of adaptation and learning that happen spontaneously as yes. a system deforms under stress. Those that's the sort of the calculus that I would like to be able to relate. Absolutely. Well absolutely and, and me too. I'm very interested in going there one step at a time, but but absolutely we would mm -hmm. like to like to do that. The lambda calculus is is quite fun. When I was a graduate student, um at MIT, we had these Lisp machines, mm. um, and of course, Lisp is is basically lambda calculus. The, 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 there's a programming language based on lambda. So I, I wrote my entire dissertation programs in the lambda calculus on the Lisp machine, which it was uh, keeping track of all the parentheses was uh, back then quite a chore. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense to you? That you know that when you think about well, like what's the difference between the program and the data in lambda calculus is just which side of the application that you do you write it on, right? <clears throat> right. If right. I take so if when one song meets another song, if an observer takes the frame of reference of song mm -hmm. A, then mm -hmm. song A is a program that is operating on song B. But if the observer uh, takes the frame of reference of song B, then song B is the program that is operating on song A. And that, right. that taking the frame of reference of is just turning around to phase lock the components sure. that are in common between the observer and song A, or turning around to phase lock with the components which are in common with song B. That's right. I, I agree. One way to put it is, is how you decide to attend to the whole system. Which, mm. way, which way are you attending to it? One way to think about this trace process is it's it's an attention. So when I trace on these three states, that means I'm, what I'm doing is just, I'm, I just want to attend to those three states. So I'm just attending to it. So it's really another way of thinking about this is it's there is this one universal consciousness in some sense, the whole, and just different ways of attending to aspects of it. Yeah. That's the way of thinking about this. And it, it, you see different music when you look at it from different points of attention. Fantastic. A lot of fun. Uh, well, Fantastic. I'm so enthused. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very, very fun. I, I was the synergy was uh, surprisingly good uh, between the ideas. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. And uh, brilliant. Well, me too. Well, Mike will have us talk again. <laughs> sure. Uh, when he left, the recording stopped, but I pressed record again, so we might be able to splice together if we need to. Oh, that would be good. Because I think this, um, this conversation might be one that would a lot of people would be interested in. Um, cool. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Don. Sure. Nice to meet you. You too.